Praise the Lord, everyone. I want to continue uh, in the I Am A Tree series. Uh, before we jump into uh, the lesson here, uh, I want us to continue to uplift everyone in prayer uh, and uh, continue just to keep certain individuals in prayer. Uh, and many of you are aware of Marvin Stevenson. Surgery went well. Thank the Lord for that. Let's continue to keep him and his family in prayer. Let's continue to remember Brother Norris in prayer. He's been in the hospital for a few days. He's doing much better. He's able to go home. Uh, so let, let, let's continue to keep him in prayer. And also Sister Shirley Hawkins, let's continue to keep her in prayer as well. Uh, and so uh, just thank the Lord for what he's doing uh, and uh, all the things that he has blessed us with. Uh, so with that being said, uh, I want us to Really take time to dive into a subject here uh, that has been on my mind and I want to deal in our root system with understanding the plan. I thank the Lord for this I Am A Tree series where we're really diving into becoming planted by the rivers of water, becoming planted in the Lord so that we can produce much fruit. Uh, and with that said, I think it's important for us, we all know, I know it's imperative for us to understand the plan of salvation, to understand what it takes, why, what does the Bible say, um, and for us to be able uh, to really get it down in our root system. So with that being said, uh, the term uh, born again, that term born again is one of the most used phrases among present day Christians. Yet if asked what the term born again means, uh, most church members could not give a clear explanation. The importance of this subject is shown in what Jesus said. He said, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Jesus is saying that to be born again is to be saved. Being born again is the plan of salvation that Jesus authored at Calvary. It is imperative that we understand what is required for us to be born again. I believe if I was to take a poll right now, I think that all of us, most of us would agree that when Jesus went to the cross, he brought in the means of salvation for everyone who will accept it. But what really happened at Calvary is the question, what can it do for me? Is even a greater question. How do I accept what was done there in my own personal life? That question can be asked of all of us and we need to be able to answer those questions. See, at Calvary, there were three steps to the work of Christ, death, burial, and resurrection, all found in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. It is very easy to see that these three steps make up the act of being born again, spoken by Jesus in John chapter three, to die, to be buried, and to rise again. This is just 
to be born again. So we see that Jesus, through his death, burial, and resurrection, bought for us the plan of being born again that I mentioned in John chapter 3, verse number 3, whereby we see, or we receive, I should say, salvation. The fact that Jesus purchased a plan of salvation for us is the greatest news the world has ever received. The thing we must understand is that not only was it necessary for Jesus to do something, but also it is absolutely essential for us to act upon what he did. That's why Jesus told Nicodemus, you must be born again. Now let's think about this here. Now, the astonishing thing is that Nicodemus was a religious leader of this day, yet he had no concept of what it meant to be born again. We find that very same thing is true in the day which we live. There are many, I mean countless, of men and women who fill the positions of spiritual leadership in our world. And they have no real understanding of the born again experience. If we can go back to John chapter 3, Nicodemus even inquired of Jesus. He said, how can a man be born again when he's old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born again? That's when Jesus began to answer unto Nicodemus. He just simply said, verily, verily, I say unto thee, except the man be born of water and of the spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. You cannot, you can't be born again of a woman. The second birth is a spiritual birth. So I want us to take notice here. Notice that Jesus said without being born again, you cannot see. He also said without being born again, you cannot enter the kingdom of God. In other words, we cannot be saved. So let's fast forward here on the day of Pentecost when Peter preached the first message after Calvary. The men cried out, what must we do? Whew, what a question. What must we do? What must I do? They cried out to Peter and to the others that were standing with him. That's when Peter said unto them, you must repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. We know that's found in Acts chapter 2, verse number 38. Peter was giving them the plan of salvation repentance, baptism, and the infilling of the Holy Ghost. If being born again is to be saved, Peter was evidently talking to them about being saved. Now let us remember something here. Remember there were three steps to Calvary, death, burial, and resurrection. The way to accept Calvary in our individual life is to accept the death, burial, and the resurrection of Christ. We don't have to literally die, be buried, and rise again. Jesus was our substitute and did this for all of us. All we must do is accept what he did by spiritually dying, symbolically being buried, and spiritually rising again. So let's walk through this. So repentance is the very first thing. We take on his death, by repentance, which is spiritual death. When a person truly repents, he dies out to his own will, renounces it forever, and vows to live from that time on according to the will of Jesus Christ. So after repentance, then we move on to baptism. In baptism, we take on his burial by baptism in water by immersion in his name. That's why the book of Romans chapter number six, verse number four says, therefore, we are buried with him by baptism. Baptism must be done by immersion for something cannot be buried by sprinkling a little bit of dirt on top of it. That burial after just a few days would certainly prove to be insufficient. Furthermore, if every Every baptism of which we have biblically record of was administered by immersion. That alone should determine our course of action on this very matter when it comes to baptism. We must be buried 
in his name. It must be underwater, completely underwater, not sprinkled. It must be buried underwater in the name of Jesus Christ. Then we move on to the infilling of the Holy Ghost. Finally, we partake of the resurrection of Jesus Christ by the infilling of the Holy Ghost. This is the new life that enables us to live as Christians should live. It cannot be done without the Holy Ghost. We see then that being born again means to spiritually die, repent, symbolically be buried, baptism, and spiritually rise again, receiving the Holy Ghost. Thus, in plain language, an individual must repent of his or her sins, be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ by immersion and receiving the gift of the Holy Ghost. You know, it says in the book of John, 1 John chapter 5, verse number 8, it says, and there are three that bear record. Or no, it says, and there are three that bear witness in the earth, the spirit, and the water, and the blood. And these three agree in one. What is one thing in which the spirit, water, and blood agree? Is it not the new birth? The blood, think about this, blood covers our sins at repentance, the waters of baptism, washes them away, thus making us cleanse for the spirit to come into our lives to dwell. When the Roman soldiers thrust that spear into Jesus' side after he died, the scripture tells us that there came forth blood and water. This was for cleansing of the nations. It, it takes blood and water to eradicate sin. Blood is the cleansing agent and water is the flushing agent. When, when a jar is washed in can, soap, and water are necessary to cleanse that jar so that it might be filled with good fruit. Likewise, blood and water are necessary to cleanse the human soul so that it may receive the spirit of Jesus Christ, which is the Holy Ghost. See, this teaching was verified by Peter when he said, repent and be baptized for the remission of sins. Remission means the removal of sins. Repentance and baptism are both absolutely essential. I'm going to say that again. They are both absolutely essential for the remission of sins. Paul taught that three steps, or I should say, he taught the three steps of Calvary is the gospel that we should preach. He taught that in 1 Corinthians chapter number 15. Uh, matter of fact, it goes on to let us know in chapter number 15, it says, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also you have received, and wherein you stand, by which also you are saved. If you keep in memory what I have preached unto you, unless you have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures and that he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. Paul went on to say in the book of Thessalonians chapter number one, he says, and to you who are troubled, rest with this. When the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel, uh -huh, that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Paul told us that the gospel is the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. How can we obey the death, burial, and resurrection? We obey it by repentance. We obey it through baptism. We obey it through the receiving of the Holy Ghost. Notice that the Lord Jesus is to appear in flaming fire, the Bible says, taking vengeance on them that know not God and that have not obeyed the gospel. So this lets me know that it is absolutely necessary for every human being to obey the gospel by being born again. Let me remind you that Jesus told Nicodemus, you must be born again. The Old Testament even speaks of the born again plan. I want us to consider um, another biblical lesson given to us concerning this subject. I mean, the Bible teaches us that the things of the Old Testament were types and shadows of things to come. 
when the priests of the law ministered by offering sacrifices, there were three major duties or three major steps to their duties. First, they slew the animal to be offered on the brazen altar. The blood here was shed and caught into a container for use in the holy place. The flesh of the animal was to be consumed by fire. This teaches us the first step of salvation, repentance. When we repent, we present our bodies a living sacrifice and our sins are covered by the blood of Jesus. After the shedding of blood, then the priests were ordered to wash at the laver and to cleanse themselves with water in preparation for entering the holy place. The laver, a, a round fountain-like figure was overlaid in the bottom with a looking glass. When the priest bent over to wash, he was able to see himself so that he could be sure that he was cleansed. Hallelujah. When an individual is baptized, he should examine himself to be sure that he is leaving the world behind once and for all. Oh, hallelujah. See, we see then that the second step of the tabernacle ministry plainly teaches us of water baptism. Blood and water were used to cleanse and prepare them for entry into the holy place. Even as blood and water cleanses us in preparation of receiving the Holy One into our lives. See, after, after cleansing, the priest would take the fire from the brazen altar and, and enter through the veil. They would enter through the veil into the holy place, and the holy place had no doors or windows through which light could come in. The only light that would come in uh, the only light that would come in would be from the golden candlesticks. These golden candlesticks or these candlesticks consisted of seven wicks filled and fed by oil uh, from seven different bowls. These wicks had to be lit with the fire brought by the priests from the brazen altar. The uniting of the oil and the fire at the candlesticks to produce light is a perfect type of the Holy Ghost and fire promise to New Testament believers. Without the light of the Holy Ghost, we could not see to live in the holy place, hmm. which is where every Christian should live. God spoke of his great plan of redemption in the Old Testament in types and shadows. And then in the New Testament, he spoke plainly to us so that we should uh, that we should have no doubt of his will. Once again, I recall the words of 1 John chapter number 1. Uh, no, 1 John chapter number 5, excuse me, that there are three that bear witness in the earth, the spirit, the water, and the blood. And these three agree in one. This Old Testament lesson beautifully re reaffirms to us the absolute necessity of of the full burnt, born again plan in each life for salvation. Now that we see this, now that we understand this, it is important for us to not get caught up in many misconceptions about salvation. There are many people that say all we have to do is just believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And all we have to do is just believe and we are saved. Well, in Acts chapter 16, it says, Sirs, Starting at verse number 30, I believe, it says, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved in thy house. Many have taken this scripture to teach that all that is required for salvation is just to believe on Jesus Christ. All we have to do is just believe on our Savior, Jesus Christ. And from that point, the individual was saved. It is definitely true that an individual must believe that Jesus is the Savior in order for us to be saved. However, Paul, who spoke these words in Acts chapter number 16, has some further teaching on this very same subject. He even speaks of it in the book of Romans chapter number 10. 
if we would just consider this text starting at verse number 13, the scripture lets us know for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. How then shall they call on him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach except they be sent? We want to be absurd here. We could just take these 13, these few verses to teach that all an individual must do for salvation is just call out the name of Jesus one time and he has received salvation. Paul teaches us they can't call on him whom they have not believed. Furthermore, he said that they couldn't believe in him of whom they have not heard. We cannot merely believe. We must believe something about Jesus Christ. See, when Paul told the jailer in Acts chapter number 16 to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, he went on to speak unto him the word of the Lord. The word which Paul spoke was apparently the gospel for the results that took place. The results was that the jailer and all his house were baptized at midnight. That's how essential baptism is for salvation, that Paul took all these people out at midnight and baptized them. So you can't tell me that baptism is important. You cannot tell me that all you have to do is just call on the name of the Lord. All you have to do is just believe and you don't have to be baptized. Why would Paul take the time to do that? Some would object here by saying that we are saved by faith alone. It is true that we are saved by faith, but it is also true that true faith always produces action on the part of the believer. That's why the book of James lets us know in chapter number two, what doth it profit, my brother? that a man say he hath faith and have not works. Can faith save him? If a brother or sister be naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you say unto them, depart in peace. Be ye warmed and feel notwithstanding ye give him not those things which are needful to the body. What doth it profit? Even so faith, if it hath not works, is dead being alone. Yea, a man may say, I've got faith and I have works. Show me thy faith without thy works and I will show you my faith by my works. Thou believest that there is one God and thou doest well. The devils also believe and tremble. But wilt thou now obey man that faith without works is dead? Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he had offered Isaac, his son, upon the altar? Seest this, how faith wrought with his works, and by works was faith made perfect. When an inv individual believes on the Lord Jesus Christ, what do they believe about him? They believe the gospel which is the death, burial, and resurrection. James teaches us that faith without action is dead, or it is not really faith at all. When a sinner hears the true gospel and truly believes, he will obey the gospel. An individual obeys the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ by repentance baptism in the name of Jesus Christ and the infilling of the Holy Ghost with the evidence of speaking with other tongues. This is the salvation of Calvary. Seest thou hast faith wrought with his works and by works was faith made perfect or in other words was made complete. If anyone out there here today is still having trouble conceding to this teaching because of the element of works involved, let's reason concerning one more point here. Being born again, repentance, baptism, and the receiving of the Holy Ghost is not considered by God to be a work because the Bible says in the book of Titus, chapter number three, verse number five, one of my favorite scriptures, we are taught here not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us. By how? The washing of regeneration and the renewing 
of the Holy Ghost. This scripture tells us that regeneration, which is being born again, is not a work of righteousness. <laughs> I would like to simply conclude on this matter. We will cite a familiar biblical example in the great revival at Samaria in the book of Acts chapter number eight, a sorcerer named Simon heard the preaching of Philip. He believed and, and the Bible says he was baptized and continued with Philip beholding the signs and miracles that were done. Many people would say that because Simon believed he was saved. Yet the apostle Peter said in the book of Acts chapter number eight, starting at verse number 23, he says, for I perceive that thou art in the gall of bitterness and in the bond of iniquity. I'm sorry, my friend, but it is impossible for anyone in the bond of iniquity to be saved. For the scripture tells us, if the son of man therefore shall make you free, you shall be free indeed. See, Simon believed and was baptized, but he had not received the Holy Ghost. Therefore, he was not born again. We cannot be half born and survive. The entire work of Calvary is necessary for salvation. We must be born again of water and of the spirit. So no matter where you are in your process, if you believe, thank you Lord for believing. If you've confessed with your mouth, I thank you Lord for confessing out of your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord and Savior. You must believe that. If you've been washed, if you've been baptized in his name, I thank you Lord for that, but don't stop. Be born completely have the complete plan of salvation, be born again of water and the spirit, which the infilling of the Holy Ghost with the evidence of speaking in other tongues. I thank the Lord because I've been born again. And I thank the Lord that I'm continuing to walk. I'm continuing to have a desire to strive to be more like him. So the entire work of Calvary, death, burial, and resurrection is necessary for salvation. We die out in repentance. We're buried with him in baptism. We rise again in newness of life, being filled with the Holy Ghost. May God bless you today. I hope this plan of salvation gets rooted in your system because it must be down deep in order for us to produce the right fruit, the fruits of the Spirit. How can we produce the fruits of the Spirit if the Spirit is not dwelling in us? So when the winds come, and they will come, when the storm comes, and it will come, we must be rooted in the plan that God has given unto us. May God bless you today. I love you all in Jesus' name.